there are some topics we wish we never had to talk to our kids about. There are some things we wish we could protect them from forever. Yet living in the world that we live in, most times the best we can do is have the conversation with our children, with kindness, with compassion, and perhaps with some tools so that they go as smoothly as possible. This week, as New York heads back to school and kids around the school are settling in to their school routines for the year, there was another school shooting that made national headlines. Helping our kids make sense of scary news headlines is a difficult but necessary part of parenting. And so Dr. Marcy and I often find ourselves providing guidance to families. And, you know, this is another one of those weeks. To be clear, this is not a discussion about politics. It is a conversation inspired by the news to provide a framework for parents to talk with kids honestly, openly, and age appropriately, regardless of your personal beliefs. So I'm Dr. Carla Engelbrecht. I have spent 25 years creating education and entertainment technology through Between. I now help families build skills for mindful, creative, and smart technology use, including when it's challenging, like in weeks like this. And I am Dr. Marcy, and I have spent the past 25 years helping families change challenging behaviors in their home. And now alongside that, I also provide crisis mental health counseling, which provides a unique lens for this particular moment and difficult conversation. And for many of us, it's a it's a professional and a personal topic to talk about this. For me, it's very personal. Uh, so I am a victim of gun violence. When I was 17, I was shot in the left side of my chest. And that experience is one of several reasons why my career is very focused on education technology and on helping families. And what I never would have expected when this happened to me 26 years ago is that we would find ourselves as a community repeatedly in a conversation where so many people are impacted by gun violence, whether it's directly, you know, as in my situation, or it's through our act, our constant access and constant connection to information through the devices in our lives. Yeah. And more people than ever are being affected by, um, by, by gun violence and, um, this past year, I was on the subway during a shooting. And while I didn't see the shooting, I didn't see anybody that was injured. I was part of that chaos and that fear that happens when we know something really bad is going on and that mass evacuation that happens. So this conversation is for those of us who are navigating this as a news event. And we want to be clear about that, that if you are home and safe, and wanting to talk to your kids about things that are happening, this is the place for you so that you can connect with the right words, have the right tools. And sometimes as parents, we're not exactly sure how to approach it well. So we wanted to bring our expertise to that conversation. We believe that it's important to be open and honest and age appropriate. So we're not... Mm -mm. Sorry, this is a hard conversation. And sometimes... Those words just get a little bit lost. So Dr. Carla and I are parenting experts and we are here to help give you the tools so that you can parent for your family best in these really hard moments. I'm gonna hand it over to you so that I can collect myself for a moment. Moment to breathe. And as we talk about how to do this, <clears throat> that thank you for being vulnerable with us. And that is okay to show to your kids too. And I know we'll talk more about that. There's really, there's two situations we find ourselves in um, sort of broadly as parents when it comes to scary headlines. There's a reactive situation where our child hears about it outside of our control and then brings it up to us or maybe even doesn't bring it up and is sad and, and impacted by it. And then there's a proactive situation where you decide you want to go ahead and have the discussion um, so that they have the information that you want them to have. I actually just did this with my own daughter who's 13 about this week. So we're gonna talk through this from a proactive perspective as well as a reactive perspective. In both cases, there's five steps that we think about this as a framework for how to have critical conversations. They're universal steps. It applies in a number of different situations. So if you've seen us talk about this before, the steps may be familiar. Um, but to walk through them so that you understand the five steps as a whole, and then we'll apply them. 
the first thing when anything happens, whether it's your child saying something to you or you hear about scary news is just to breathe. You are no use to anyone in your family. If you are having your own freak out, you cannot have a sane conversation in that place. So you need to breathe. You need to take care of you first, have your feelings in private with other adults if you need to. If you have a moment where you are overwhelmed, it's okay to say, hey, I'm I'm sad. I'm having feelings right now. I just need a moment to breathe because your self-care matters and also models to kids how you how you take care of yourself so that they learn that. So Marcy, step two. Step two, which Carla, I feel like I just modeled that like needing to take that moment to breathe unintentionally. So step two is gathering information. And depending on whether it's a proactive or a reactive conversation, they're going to look different. But here are some guidelines around how you have critical conversations when you're gathering information. One, don't assume that you know what your child is thinking or feeling. You may, in fact, know what they're thinking and feeling. But going in without that assumption that you know and letting them express it and find it for themselves is important. Ask questions and be curious. You want to be gathering information from them. So really listen to their answers. If they ask questions, answer them. This may seem simple and it is, but it's not always easy because the words that we sometimes have to use can be really challenging, especially with these type of difficult topics. Also make sure your answers are age appropriate and honest. Emphasize safety. Let them know that they are safe, that you are safe, that everything is okay, at least in this moment while you're having this conversation. Share how you're feeling and how you're navigating. It's important for them to know that it's normal to feel scared or upset or confused or you fill in whatever your feeling is because it gives them permission to feel all of their kerfuffliness inside. It's also okay to not have the answers. There are so many of these questions that I don't have the answers for that I I don't know. And you're not going to know either. And it's okay to tell that to our kids, to say things like, I don't know, or to say things like, this is confusing, or I wish things are different, or maybe we can find some answers together. Those are all acceptable ways to share. You don't have to be able to tell them every answer. You just have to be able to answer their questions, two different things. And the final piece of having these critical conversations is have short conversations, multiple short conversations. The information is overwhelming. The feelings can be really big. And sometimes for our kids, they're not really big because it takes them time to process the information. So you want to have many short conversations and allow them to digest. As an adult, we want to like dive through everything, but that's not necessarily what our kids need. So we're going to go slow. Then step three is a, the pro, of the process is assess your child's physical and mental well-being. How are they doing with this information? How are they doing with what's happening around them? And you're going to do that by noticing, is your child distressed? Are they saying that with their words? Some of your children will say like, I am not okay with this. This is not okay. I don't like it. And they will tell you how they're feeling. Listen to their words, especially in a, in the world where there's a culture that boys aren't allowed to cry. Notice if they're fighting back tears and trying to be strong when they're not really ready to be strong. Notice some other signs of, are they having a hard time sleeping? Are they having a hard time eating? Are they more disengaged than usual? Are they more engaged than usual? Are they wanting lots of hugs and affection? And that's not their normal character. As a parent, it can feel lovely to have your kids snuggle up if they don't normally do that but that is also a sign of distress and big feelings. Basically in the assessment, you are looking for any change in their behavior and their reaction to what's happening around them. Once you've done all of this gathering information of step two and assessing how they are doing in step three, you're gonna move into step four, which is creating an action plan. You have to create it and then you have to implement it. And both are in step four. So this is all going to depend on what you find in step two and three. It's all going to depend on what your child needs and what you need and your family needs. So I want you to think about, since we're in the general concept of how do you support their trauma? Now, given that this is information they're learning, I just want to remind you that secondary trauma 
or the trauma of, of seeing something, hearing about something, understanding something is real and it also needs support. And it can sometimes need just as much support as if you were in the situation yourself. So it's easy to disregard of, oh, you just read it on the internet or, or you just saw a picture, but that, that can create real big impact. You wanna think about how you're gonna support your family in this action plan. Maybe there's friends, other parents, your child's friends that are ages, what's happening in school that you wanna consider, how you're gonna support them. And then the community that's in crisis, is there something that you wanna be doing and involved for them? Whether that's sending a donation or making cards, sending them pictures to let them know that they are cared for and thought of, um, or whether that's volunteering to remind your children that there is good in the world and that they can give back to good. Action becomes the antidote to a lot of the big feelings, especially around fear and anxiety and uncertainty. When we can do something to help us feel safe, that's the action plan we wanna move into. And then as you navigate from that acute crisis moment, which may, you know, may unfold over the course of a week or two, but then there's this notion of step five, which is the maintenance plan, because just you, because you dealt with that moment doesn't mean that there's not going to be lingering questions or impact that happens. And it's really easy for us as parents to forget about the maintenance plan. And so what that can look like is an intentional check-in with them regularly, where you ask like, hey, how are you doing? Do you have additional questions about this? Or it might be a more gentle check-in, depending on how you know, you know your child best. It can also mean very tactical things like limiting media exposure for a while. And that might be part of your action plan. It might be part of your maintenance plan. So during your action plan, you may just decide, we're just not going to watch national news right? That's, that's a decision off. And I, I make that very frequently when there's scary headlines, but in an ongoing maintenance plan sense, it might also be, you know what, I'm not going to watch these particular channels, or I'm not going to engage with these particular apps anymore because it's just too upsetting for me. And then like Dr. Marcy said, intentionally creating space to continue to do volunteer and community work, which can help remind us all that there are good people everywhere doing good work. And this is one that often it feels a little funky to talk about when we're in a time like this, but intentionally creating space for fun. We can feel guilty when other people are suffering, when we try to find reasons for us to smile. But not every moment of life has to be a lesson in grief and processing sadness. It is okay to have those moments where it's like, we have, we've done good work around this and now we're going to take moments for ourselves to find the joy in life. So important. Yeah. So, so important. So important. So those are our five steps, right? To breathe, to gather information, to assess mental okay. and physical health, to create and implement that action plan, and to create and implement that maintenance plan. So let's talk through what does this look like in reality? So let's say, let's take that reactive situation. You've got an 11 year old child who comes home from school and says, there were kids who were killed this week with gun violence in a school, right? The first thing you need to do is breathe. Acknowledge, you know, acknowledge and say, wow, like that's, that's a big, that's a, yes, like that is, that's a big statement, right? And that makes me feel things. So let's just take a moment and breathe and collect yourself. And this is one of those moments where you have to very quickly decide, are you right into step two, three, or is your, are you in a place where you can be like, um, I'd like to get some more information and then we can talk about this, right? You're going to have to make an in the moment decision of, I can take a quick breath, gather myself, or I can take a moment and, you know, and figure out the plan from here. So, but first and foremost, breathe, make sure you're okay to have the conversation. And if, Worst case, you can say, I very, I hear you. I want to talk about this. Give me five minutes. Give me an hour. We're driving. It's really hard to have this conversation right now while driving. That happens a lot. The kids bring up things when you least expect it, right? So saying like, I want to give you the attention you deserve for this topic. Let's get to this place. And then we'll have the conversation. So step one, take care of you. Yep. And especially if you hadn't heard about it, you can say to your child, I, I haven't heard that. I want to go find out some information and then talk to you about it from a 
knowledgeable place. Like all of these things are important and necessary. And we forget that we can take that time. Then you go, when you're ready, you go into step two, which is gathering information. So part of that is for yourself in the world, but part of that is with your child. And you're just going to ask questions. And maybe you're going to make some statements, but you're going to ask them questions. And the statements are going to be like, that's interesting, or that's a lot to reinforce what they're saying. But you're going to ask them, where did they hear this information? What else do they know? Have they seen anything about it, right? Did they just hear it from a friend who told them or did their friend pull up a social media app and show them video, show them pictures? Did they see anything with their own eyes that was hard to digest? Wonder with them, like, I, I wonder what other thoughts you're having. I'm curious what, how this all makes you feel, right? For an 11 year old, you don't want to be saying, I'm sure that feels scary, or you might be afraid now. Don't name their emotions. Just ask them how they're feeling about all of this. If you have a four to six year old, you might name the feeling because they don't have those words yet. With an 11 year old, you want them to advocate. I want to remind you that whatever your child's reaction is, is okay. It's easy to be like, my child's not upset enough or they're too upset. Um, I had one friend who, when their child came home and there was a, a school shooting incident and they heard about it, she said, so am I not going to have at, at a different school, not in her school? She said, so am I not going to have school tomorrow? And her mom was devastated. And I was like, no, 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 don't be devastated. She has learned that when bad things happen in schools, schools close. It was logic, not lack of caring. So just know that whatever your child shares about how they're feeling, they're okay. Or not okay, but the reaction isn't the response about that. Ask them if they want to find out more, if they want to learn more with you. And I would also ask them what they want to do with this information, right? Often our kids expect us to come up with the plan, but you might say, you know, with an 11 year old, you know, what do you want to do about it? And they might have a really thoughtful, caring response of this is how I want to experience, think about support this moment. Maybe they're going to say like, I just, I just want to go for a walk with you, or I just need to go play with the dog, or I want to make some pictures and send it to them. Kids can be really thoughtful and it can surprise us. So ask them, what do you want to do? And just a reminder to be curious and listen, only answer questions. If they actually asked you a question, don't share the information you found in this moment, because this is their place to speak and share. The other part of step two, so part of step two is very much about talking directly with the child. The other piece though is understanding what in their environment they may have watched, seen, had access to. So this is where you might need to go look at what have they been watching? Look at their search history. What kind of information do they have access to? Have they been texting with friends about things? Have they been on a social media site or on um, a video streaming site where there's information? You might even check in with other parents or the school to hear if discussions have been happening. This is it happens a lot where um, kids are talking to each other and suddenly you know one parent pings another parent and they find out that there is this threat of information. But parents don't always know who to tell of the other friends that this is happening. So there's this part of this step two, which is also just going out and finding out what your child has seen, because that's going to help inform what you may need to talk about. Because if they've seen very graphic imagery or, you know, or misinformation, that that are things, those are things that you need to address in addition to their general state of being. And then we go to step three, which is assessing their physical and mental health needs and status. So first you're gonna notice the words they use. Are they using inflammatory language and are they really exaggerating the situation? Are they cursing and they don't usually curse? Conversely, are they using words of apathy of like, I just don't care or it doesn't matter or life, life's not a big deal or we're never safe anywhere. They might say one phrase and it might feel like a throwaway to them, but catch it and hear it because that will give you information about what's happening internally for them that they may not have the language for to advocate themselves well, or they may not even know they're feeling themselves. Our words give us insight 
to what's going on. Notice how they're sitting when you're talking about this. Are they like leaning in? And as I talked about before, are they like snuggling up to you and holding your hand? And they never normally do that. Or are they like leaning back, arms crossed, looking away, not caring? Now that could be a regular 11 year old posture, I know. But if that's not typical for your kid, that is a protective mechanism. So notice how are they sitting? What is their body language? Are they more fidgety than normal? Are they sitting really still? And they don't normally do that. Pay attention to their temperament over the course of a couple hours or, or that day that you're in this fact-finding experience of, are they short-tempered? Are they snippy at you more so than normal? Are they teary more than normal? Just like, what is their temperament? Are they eating everything around them? Right? And then the final piece is to just notice their self-care. And this might be a longer time because it may take a few days for you to see a pattern, but are they having a hard time sleeping? Are they having a hard time eating? Are they not doing the self-care routines of, you know, if you have a, an 11 year old who usually gets dressed and like really cares what they wear, doesn't care what they're putting on. They're just like putting on a dirty t-shirt. That is a sign that they are not okay in their physical and mental well-being. Once you've gathered all of this, you're going to take some quiet time with yourself. If you're co-parenting with that person and you're going to create a plan and then put it in place. And that plan is going to require talking to your child about that. So in, in step two, when you're gathering information, you might say, hey, I want to think about this. And I'm going to get back to you because I think that there are some things that we can do together that'll be really helpful, right? You can let your child know more is coming. You're just not ready yet. So when you're ready, you're going to make a plan and you're going to put it in place. And that plan really should include communicating and also creating a safety plan. Make sure your child knows that they are safe if they are, and what you are doing to keep them and you as safe as possible. We can't lie to them, right? So we can't say this will never happen to you because we don't know, right? Carl and I are two people who before our instances, I would have said this will never happen to me. And that's not true. So how am I staying as safe as possible? How are you keeping your family as safe as possible? The action plan can be going and finding more information and talking through what they heard, what's true, what's real, what's misinformation. How do you know that it's misinformation so that they have a clear story of what actually happened in the particular incident you're talking through? Ask them if they have questions. And then as Carla mentioned before, part of your action plan needs to be loving up your kids, create memories go to their favorite restaurant, take the time, plan to go on the weekend to their favorite park, go play sports with them, play some board games. Part of what makes these moments so tragic and hard and so heartbreaking broken for the families left behind is they will never have those magical moments with their, with their children and with their loved ones again. And so it is a moment, and while it can feel strange, but it is a moment to double down on having those amazing moments with the people you love. And you can say to them, it feels weird to be so sad and eat ice cream. It feels so weird to be going to mini golf while it feels like the world is upside down. But we're going to do it anyway, because while you are off doing that thing, there will be laughter. There will be joy. Someone will hit a hole in one and you will forget the tragedy that happened and lose yourself in that moment. And that is healing. And that is what brings your family back together and helps ease everything. And then you also want to put in place, and it depends on how your child is feeling, something to support the feelings that they are having. And that could be a long-term plan of therapy. That could be connecting with a therapist that they're already with. That could be just doing a regular check-in with them about how you're feeling and how I'm feeling, but actions move emotions. So you want to think about what can we do if we're having big feelings, how do, how, what can we do? Do we want to write letters to people who, who lost loved ones? Do we want to write letters to the students in the school saying that they are cared about and that you're thought about them? If you are part of a religious community, do you, do you want to go to a prayer circle? Do you want to send a donation to families in need? And as we've talked about before, do you want to go volunteer somewhere? Because even if it is not connected 
to the violence that just happened. It is a way to make amends in the world, to make bring goodness back into it and to remind us that there is a way to heal and move forward and help each other and for there to be good people in the world because we need, that is part of what heals because it can get so dark if we only stay in the tragedy of what unfolded. You have to help remind your child that there is other things in life to be part of. <clears throat> and one of the ways that we heal through crisis is to connect with community. So volunteering is a beautiful way to connect to community that is bigger than ourselves. Part of that, um, part of that connecting and that, that taking action also means removing some of the, the triggers that exist. And so very tactically, it might mean also looking within your home and saying, oh, let's restrict technology access. Let's maybe if you're a home that leaves the television on in the background, maybe we're not going to do that for a little while. Um, or we're going to not use social media apps for a little while, or we're only going to read the news instead of watching the news. This is a big one. Um, shifting to where you can read the news means you have much more control over what information is coming in and how far down you go um, and can much more quickly stop it. Um, and you don't always have as graphic, you know, visual image can be much more, much harder than written word. So looking at just around your home, around your kid's environment, right? Talking with other parents about, hey, we're limiting these things. Um, you know, sometimes other parents are like, oh, I didn't think about doing that. So even just having those conversations can be part of that immediate action plan. And it also becomes part of the longer term maintenance plan. Um, so shifting into step five of, you know, what is that maintenance plan for longer term uh, care. Sorry. Oof, there we go. Um, my sunlight got a little happens there. Um, the maintenance plan from a technology perspective is thinking about, are there permanent changes or at least more longer term changes we want to make around our technology consumption? So do we want to maybe make a decision that we're not going to leave a news channel on in the background, um, but instead intentionally make a shift towards we're either going to read it or we're going to intentionally turn on a news show rather than kind of letting it bombard us? Are we going to um, change filters on some of our apps or even change apps or change how we approach watching videos where we're intentionally going to watch um, creators, right? Watch their pages, their work rather than generalized algorithmic feeds. Because what happens when there is national news is it, it gets talked about a lot. And the way these algorithms work that then is labeled popular content, the algorithm doesn't know that it's scary popular content and it starts showing it to more people because there are people engaged with that. But that's why when you're scrolling through a, a feed of videos and you're happily watching your puppies and flowers and things that you kind of curated it to be, one of these videos can get in there because the algorithm has labeled it popular and thinks more people want to see it. Um, so even thinking about how do we just manage that, um, which is a whole other conversation too, but you can start to approach it here. And it really, this, and talking about this with your kids, it's part of that idea of how do you mentor them to continue to be smart and mindful about their digital technology use? Because they don't understand why this just appears in their feeds as they're watching videos. They don't understand even why it's, you know, there is a there is a uh, reaction in our brains in the limbic system of like fight or flight and protect that is like, oh, this is scary. I need to. And they don't understand what's happening. A lot of us as adults don't understand what's happening. So being able to start working through this and helping mentor them and monitor what's happening, because this is part of that safety and that growing trust and that growing learning experience around technology. Yeah. So the main thing gives you that opportunity. Yeah. And that monitoring piece, that mentoring piece leads to this beautiful idea that I encourage families to do in general, but this might be a great time to start it for your family of doing regular check-ins, setting a time, whether it's daily, depending on your kid, but usually it's about once a week where you say, we're going to have a check-in and I'm going to ask you how you're feeling sometimes about things that we've talked about in the past or big things that are going on in the world. And sometimes just in general, how are you? And so having a time where the frequency is higher 
on the tail of a big event, but having that in general as part of your relationship with your child, it's part of that mentorship of teaching them to be responsible with their feelings. Because sometimes something will come up and you're in the middle of doing something else where you can't stop and talk about it. So saying, hey, we have that time together. And that mentorship of how to navigate our big feelings when we're in the maintenance part of this program can be really, really beautiful and wonderful and helpful. So with that, we're going to go into the proactive conversation. So if there is a situation like what we just happened and you want to talk to your child, you are aware that they have friends, that in school it's going to be talked about, that there is going to be a discussion. You know that they're having active shooter drills at their school in general. You know that this is something that your child is going to hear about from somewhere else. And you've decided you want to hear it from that, from yourself and your inside your family first, which I will say when that feels right for you, I really encourage you to do that. I always suggest to parents that you be the first voice that your child hears of these difficult conversations. It does two things. One, it allows it to be an intentional, thoughtful conversation. And two, it allows you to instill the views and the morals and the perspective that you have. Now, it's not always possible because sometimes things happen in real time and your child is already in school and, and you didn't have a chance to, or you didn't know, and they hear it somewhere else. But when possible, it is a great way to connect. So when you're navigating a proactive conversation, it's still the same five steps, but it looks a little different because you have more control over the situation. You're deciding when and where and how it's going to unfold. So the first three steps, while they're still the same, breathe, gather information and assessing physical and mental uh, needs is still, it, it's still happening, but it's going to be more focused on you and your introspection and decisions of what to do. So step one, right? You hear about news and you need to process it and you need to make a decision of like, oh, is this something I do want to engage with my child about and talk to them proactively? And then you're going to go to step two and you're going to gather information, which may be about checking in with the school on have they addressed it? Are they going to address it? What language are they using it? It might be checking in with other parents saying, you know, how are you thinking and talking about it? Might be thinking about, if I can take Dr. Carla's expertise for a minute, think about what they have access to, where they might be finding that information and what you want to do. You want to learn about the event for yourself. You want to brainstorm. What are the questions my child might have? What may there be their reaction to? And then the other piece of gathering information that is unique for the proactive is look at your schedule. And where are there good moments for you to have this conversation? You don't want to have this conversation on the way to soccer and then have your child potentially be distressed as they're going into soccer practice. You might want to have it on the way home from soccer because you're then going into dinner, but not if you're going right into homework. So look at your schedule and think about where is it best to have a few short conversations so you can have that be part of your plan. Leads into step four really easily. Step three assessing physical and mental health, that again is going to be mostly your own. Where are you? How are you? What support do you need? And then noticing those external pieces without talking to your child yet, because you're not ready for that conversation, but are they okay? Do they seem to know? Are they giving any indication of distress or of insight of what's happening? Is there something different going on? And then you're at step four, right? Because those are all happening in your own time. And, and with a situation um, like this of the school violence, you have a short window to get it done. With certain information, you have a longer window, but you have a shorter window because it's more likely you will flip into a reactive situation if you wait too long. So when you're creating a plan, you're going to find a time to talk to your child. You're going to share with them what happened and why you want them to know. Now, Dr. Carla and I have been very mindful of not using all of the exact words of what happened because we are all fatigued. We are all overwhelmed. We all hear them all the time. I am going to use them right now so that you have an example of what it might look like in talking to your child. And if you need to fast forward 30 seconds, go for it. Okay. So you might say, 
something happened in a school yesterday. And I want you to know, because I want you to hear it from me first. And I want you to hear about it while you are safe. And while we are together, because I love you more than anyone in the world. There was a school shooting in a high school in Georgia. There was a student who went in in the morning with a gun and shot some students and teachers. Four people died, nine people were injured, and the people that were injured all are, are supposed to make a full recovery, so they're gonna be okay. The community is coming together. The neighbors were there to support the students as they were leaving the school, and it was really hard for them. How do you feel hearing this? So that may be the conversation you want to have with your child. You may have a different perspective, a different view, a different ideology. So please know that this is just an example of the possibility, but I do encourage you to use the real words so they understand what happened. I would also focus on the safety of what was done, the lives that were impacted, and not necessarily on the, on the shooter, on his, you know, people get really fascinated with that story, but that's not helpful for your child feeling safe and grounded and sane and okay. That adds to the swirl of chaos that we feel. So focus on the repair that happens after that, the community coming together, the support that is there and how you can support each other. I would share how you are, you and your family are safe, what you are doing to maintain that safety and reducing the likelihood um, is your, does your school have precautions in place? Does your, do your children do active shooter drills? Most schools do at this point and kind of how, what are the elements that are there to ensure this is less likely to ever happen to them? Ask them what questions they have and then answer honestly, age appropriately and honestly. Let them know that they can come back and talk to you at any time when they have questions. So also be prepared for them to come at unexpected moments to ask you them and then let them know any additional action steps that you're going to take as a family. Are you going to send cards? Are you going to have an art day together and maybe send it to them, but also maybe just some therapeutic art for yourselves? Are you going to send donations? Are you going to have a gathering of friends and loved ones because other, other parents, you know, are also having these big conversations with, with their families. Are you going to go to a community event because you know that will help us remember that the world is bigger than this one incident. Are you gonna to volunteer to remember that there are good things again? And what are you gonna do in the next few days to create those magic moments, those memories, that goodness? Because that is why we wanna have these conversations so we can get back to feeling that goodness. Go slow, make sure it's short, and then transition to something else in the day. And just as we talked about in the reactive step, part of this action plan is also, again, that like, how are, how are we navigating media at home and technology and our access to information? And so are we, again, going to make changes to how we engage with the news and with social media and we're going to you know restrict to reading or we're going to just take a break um, and we might even take a, a digital break for a little while. And so talking through those pieces as well as part of all of this action plan, which also then allows you to start thinking about and creating and implementing that step five maintenance plan of what does this look like now over time? Because now you've introduced a heavy topic, a hard topic. And so this might marinate back there and some questions may come up. And so you may decide we're going to make some permanent changes to how we consume, or at least you know, sort of longer term changes. If you have an older kid, might have some very real conversations about access to information and how we help not get surprised by it or how, how we navigate misinformation. And so when we hear something, what do we do? You can go, you know, come to me and let's talk about it. We can go do research and understand like, what is the truth here? So it's an opportunity to really continue thinking about how do you want to mentor your child when it comes to navigating scary news headlines and just, you know, information in general that comes at us in unexpected ways. And then there's also the piece of how do we just continue talking with them 
about what they're feeling and thinking as they continue to learn about the world that we live in. You know, part of our job as parents, as hard and sad and challenging as it is, is helping our kids make sense of how to navigate the world that we live in, which means having these hard conversations, which means checking in with them, which means keeping an eye on has their mood changed, right? You as the parent know your child best. And so if some behaviors start to shift, you know, um, Dr. Marcy had a great list of them at the beginning. If you start to see they're using words that are very inflammatory and are not what they normally use, or they're, they become more quiet than usual, right? Those are all signals that maybe you need to do the check-in as part of your maintenance plan. And maybe you need to go back to step one, step two, and, and, you know, go back into this phase because this is a process that exists all the time. Yeah. So as we wrap things up, we want to make sure that you remember there is no perfect way to have this conversation. To remember that you will misspeak and misstep and say something be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. We have, we've all done that. That is part of parenting. That is part of being human. That is part of having these critical conversations. And the fact that you are willing to have the conversation to go into this uncomfortable space is what matters more than anything else. So don't try to make the conversation perfect. Just have the conversation again and again and again with your kids. Okay. So thank you for taking this time with us. Just as a recap, the five steps to have a critical conversation are breathe, gather information, assess your child's mental and physical health needs, create and implement an action plan, and then put in place a maintenance program so that it can create lasting change in your family. We hope that these tools have helped. We hope this framework has helped. It is never easy having these conversations, but know that taking the time to be thoughtful about it makes it that much easier. If there, if you have specific questions, please put them in the comments below or reach out to us. As you may know, or there's linked on my YouTube, you can find me at drmarcy.com, D-R-M-A-R-C-I-E.com. Dr. Carla can be found at betweened.com, B-T-W-N-D.com. They will both be linked below. We are happy to help you with your individual questions and needs and support you as you go through these, these big moments that are part of your life and your kids' lives to help make it a little bit easier when everything feels upside down. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for trusting us. And may you have some beautiful memories with your kids this week. Take care.